name is Hannes and today I want to talk to you about making sensible choices as a development team. Now my talk is about um, my personal pet peeve, you know, something that has been annoying me for a very long time. And the problem isn't really getting any smaller either. So I felt that I needed to talk to you about this. See the thing that we do as software developers is deliver value. We want to provide software that delivers some kind of value to the businesses that are going to use it. Seems pretty simple, right? Well, it's really not. Let me tell you about the magpie. The magpie is a black and white bird. It has a pretty long tail. It grows up to about 45 centimeters long and it has a wingspan of up to about 60 centimeters. They are omnivores, so they eat pretty much everything and they're very intelligent. And the rumor has it that they are attracted to shiny things. And this bird is not that different from the typical software developer. See, a software developer is a black or a white human being or even uh, another um, race. They don't have any tails. They grow up to about 220 centimeters tall. They don't have any wings, but they're also omnivores and they're also pretty intelligent and they're also attracted to shiny things. But for them, the shiny things are frameworks and libraries and all these other cool new things. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, is that a surprising behavior to begin with? Because technology is constantly evolving and new things and new frameworks are invented all the time. And unlike for instance, carpentry, our profession is still very young, which means that there are no clear cut ways of doing things. We're still inventing stuff as we go. So there is no fixed recipe for success. But regardless of this, we chose to get into this profession, which means that we like all these changing conditions, right? Now, if you think about our education as computer programmers, and if you compare that to building houses, in our education we will learn how to lay bricks. And we will learn how to lay bricks and how to build a wall. And one of the other classes that you're going to get is going to be the equivalent of tiling a wall. So you'll, you'll be able to lay bricks and you'll be able to tile, and then you're going to get a class about how to construct roof timber, right? And maybe another class that you're gonna get is how to draw an electrical wiring diagram. And then maybe another class is how to do pipes for plumbing. And that's what you'll learn in school. And then you graduate and you get your first job. And the question that they're gonna ask you and the thing that you're gonna be asked to do is can you design and build a house? Which is vastly different than just possessing these little skills. So, naturally, we look for guidance and we try to find guidance in places where we think that we can find successful people. And conferences, not unlike this one, is one of these places. You can go to a conference and you can see software developers speak about all the times that they have been very successful. So you look at those people. You might also go on the internet and read some blog posts or some articles or whatever about people who have done successful software projects. And, apart from that, you could look at what the big guys are doing. What is Google doing? Amazon, Netflix, Spotify, because all these companies are very open about a lot of their development practices. And you do what these people do. That's how you actually build software. And you do that until you run into a wall. That's what happens. You hit that wall. But why do you run into that wall? That's an important question to ask, because you did everything as the big players did, yet you still hit a wall somewhere. So for that, you're going to have to join me on an adventure with chat. You know, I want to give you a disclaimer. Any similarities with any actual people are merely coincidental. I mean, chat is just a guy that I invented. And when I Google, like, chat gif, I got this. Chat, a bit of an asshole kicking, like, an inflatable penguin. And I'm gonna take you on six stories with Chad today and try and figure out where Chad's team went wrong. And I'm gonna give you those insights. Um, 
After that, well, I'll tell you a little bit about a little gimmick that I can give you after this. First story is about RavenDB. Now, what happened is we had a piece of software that processed text files. And it extracted about 70% of the, the usable data in that text file and put it into our system and stored it in a database. But we figured that that extra 30% would become useful at some point. So we wanted to store those text files for future use so that we could parse the data that we needed from them in the future, right? So we gave this task to Chad, and what did Chad do? He said, oh, we should use RavenDB, because he had recently become a fan of RavenDB. So what he did is um, he set up a server, installed RavenDB on it, parsed all the data from the text files, dumped it into a, a document into the RavenDB collection and stored that. You might think, okay, that's a sensible solution. But what went wrong with this? The thing is that RavenDB comparatively is pretty expensive if you look at it per gigabyte. Because you have to run a quite powerful server with disks and so on, you have to maintain the operating system, you have to maintain the database um, engine. And apart from RavenDB, this solution wasn't really the best that we could have done. Because that solution took longer to write and it breaks every time the structure of the text files changes. So, except for like maintaining our own system, we also had to um, maintain the storage solution for no reason whatsoever, because we didn't even know if we were, go were going to need the data. So that wasn't really sensible. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is what did Chad forget? And the question that he didn't ask himself properly is the question, is this technology really, technology really suitable to solve my problem? It's the question about technical fit. Is this a fit for the problem that I'm having? And the questions that you can ask yourself if you're thinking about technical fit are questions like these. Does this help with my problem? How does this compare about other possible solutions? Is there something that might be even better suited for our problem? Is this the simplest thing we can do? Or does it bring any unnecessary costs with it? All of that. So when you apply that, to RavenDB, RavenDB is a database, which means that it's also optimized to be queried. And if you only use the database engine to store data, it becomes really, really expensive. That's not what you want. So instead of this, what could Chad have done? He could have just used Azure, Azure Blob Storage and just dumped the blobs, the text files in there. There's no parsing that can break. There is nothing that can go wrong. The cost per gigabyte is extremely low. And you can easily uh, make the storage redundant across the globe so that if something fails, you don't lose your data. And there is no maintenance to that from your team because you just provision the storage account and you're done. So that would have been a more sensible solution for Chad than RavenDB. Now let me take you on the second story. The second story is about a framework called Agata. Now, the thing that we were solving is we were building an ASP.NET MVC application and the code had become somewhat messy. It had become messy because there were a lot of juniors working on this project and uh, some remote um, developers that we employed abroad and not everybody had like the best coding practices. So everything was sitting together, data access, business logic, uh, UI controllers, everything was sitting together. So that wasn't really good. So what we were going to do is to cut that in half so that the logic and the database uh, access were shielded from the UI code to at least avoid some n plus one selects and that sort of stuff. So what we were looking for is a framework that allowed us to, to basically cut that in half without introducing too much friction. And Chad came up with Agata. Agata is a framework that Chad had used before. He had some good knowledge and it was a technical fit for our problem. It helped us cut our code base logically in half. And it allowed us to have no n plus one selects in the, in the front end. 
And if we want, it could run in process, but at some point, if we wanted to deploy the service and the UI separately, that was also possible with Agenda. So it was really a technical fit to what we wanted to do. But what went wrong? Well, it's important to know that this happened in 2014. But the people from Agada basically stopped maintaining it in 2013. And there's only a single maintainer. And that guy apparently vanished, vanished off the face of the earth. Which meant that new features didn't make it into the framework that we so needed. Like a sync await support, for instance. Or the dependencies that Agata had, like its DI containers, those dependencies didn't get updated. So you were stuck on like a very, very old version of your DI container package. So Agata, instead of helping us, had become a liability to the project. Now, what question did chat forget to ask himself? It's like, can this technology become a risk? And the answer is yes, it can. You should check for warning signs. And the warning signs that you can check for are pretty obvious. Who maintains this library? Are these people still actively working on it? Are there multiple maintainers? Is the source code available? Are you allowed to legally use that source code? Does the license allow you to take it and continue working on it? Is there maybe a licensing model? Might that licensing model change? Did the company become a, uh, just, uh, did it get acquired by another party? All these things can be warning signs that your technology might become a risk to your project. So what could Chad have done is he could have chosen Mediator. Beautiful framework written by Jimmy, um, but there's also other contributors. So even if Jimmy were to like, um, for some reason disappear of the face of the earth, he would just, um, some other people could still continue on the project. It's open source under Apache license. So if, even if all the maintainers disappear, you can continue building it. So that's a really, really a better solution. And it basically has the same, function, the same functionality as Agenda. So that would have been a way better um, product with no warning signs. And that was also a technical fit. Let's continue to the next story. And this one is about Event Store. Now the project that we were working on is, it was a very big ASP.NET MVC application, but the code structure was pretty okay. There was some proper solid implementation in there. The I container was used properly. We interfaced with some other um, products inside the same company over an event bus that was loosely coupled. That's all, it was all pretty, pretty well built. Um, so the task that we had to do is to add an extra page with some functionality. And one of the features on this page that was that there had to be an audit log. And this really triggered chat because chat had recently become a fan of CQRS and event sourcing. And he became a really big fan of Greg Young. So when he was asked to do the screen, he was already sitting there like, okay, I'm going to use event store. And the technical fit is okay. And there were no warning signs. So that was pretty good. Um, so Chad went, went on and he implemented um, his screen using Event Store. And he even wrote a wrapper for Event Store so that the other developers who came after him didn't have to know all the details. They could just use the wrapper and uh, be done with it. Now, what went wrong? The team contained a whole bunch of juniors and some remote uh, contractors, and none of them had any Event Store knowledge. And this resulted in the team never touching any of the event store stuff. Because also the wrapper wasn't really built in a way that you could use it for all use cases. It was built for the one use case that Chad had to do on that one screen. And if none of the team actually maintained it, all the work that, that came to those screens, because Chad started using it in more and more screens, all that work came to check and that, to Chad, and that was like a liability for the team as well. So what did he forget is ask yourself the question, can we get the whole team up to speed on this? Team skills, it's a very, very important thing to take into account. Because if you cannot get your team up to speed on using this technology properly, that is going to become a risk in the long run as well. So you should ask yourself self questions, just such as, do we have the knowledge? And if we don't have the knowledge, can we get that knowledge but with training or, or books or whatever? And can we teach the rest of the team? And can everybody work on the code that we're going to write this way? 
do we need to document certain things? Those are very important questions because if you can keep your whole team up to speed on the technology stack that you're using, that's your ideal scenario, right? Now, what could Chet have done to avoid that this became a liability is spread his knowledge. He had the knowledge. He could just spread it to the team. He could give and have given workshops or he could have pair programmed with other people. Um, he could have documented how his wrapper worked and he could have helped everybody take their first steps in the event store and that would have helped the whole team be productive with the technology. This is not like um, a site consideration when you're choosing technology. This is essential. Everybody has to get up to speed on it or you shouldn't be using it. All right? Okay, we're halfway through. Those were three stories. I have three more and then we're gonna wrap this talk up. So the next story is about Entity Framework. And Chad came to me and he said, we need to talk. Okay, we need to stop using Entity Framework. Entity Framework is bad. I mean, it is, it is very slow. Um, we have no control over the SQL. The SQL that it outputs is really ugly. And well, all of these things are kind of true, but the context is that the application that we were building was like 95% CRUD, which Entity Framework is perfect for. So what I did is I took uh, some time and I sat with Chad and I asked him, like, what are your frustrations with Entity Framework? He said, yeah, it's very slow. It does too many things. We have no control over the SQL and so on and so on. And the thing is, he showed me like a profiled query and it's really ugly SQL. And then what, what went wrong uh, is we started profiling together. And we noticed a couple of things. What we saw is that one of the reasons that Chad thought that MD framework work was really slower than it really is, is that he was looking at, at his debug timings. And the first time you instantiate a context, yeah, that takes a lot of time because it has, has to build its all, um, pardon me, it has to build its entire uh, mental model of how the, the code and the database look. And that's slow, but subsequent DB context instantiations are, are a lot faster. We also saw that the code contained some n plus one selects, which made for a lot of uh, database round trips, which made the whole code a lot slower as well. There was a missing index on one of the queries. Um, there were a couple of, of places where you could have used projection to uh, query less fields from the database, so that could have been a lot faster as well. And we also compared the query plan of, of these ugly queries, like, like this one, with like the one that he had manually written and the query plan was actually pretty much identical. So SQL Server knows how to deal with this. So the thing is, um, until that day, Entity Framework had been magic to Chad. He didn't know what was going on inside. So he didn't really know how to use it properly. And if you have a clue on how it works and how lazy loading works and how DB context instantiations work and all those things, then you can use it properly and you can squeeze a lot of performance out of it. And after that day, Chad actually became an Entity Framework fan. So, what did he forget? Well, you can ask yourself the question, how was this framework built? Do you understand what the people who built it needed to use to actually build something like Entity Framework? And I call this take away the magic. If the framework stops being magic to you, you will probably use it properly. So ask yourself questions like, do I know how it works? Do I understand what the people who built this, um, what they had to use technology-wise to get it up and running? what concepts are applied, what frameworks did they use, and so on, all this kind of stuff. And if you understand that, you also know what the effect of your usage is going to be, and it's going to be a lot easier um, to, uh, to use it correctly. And theoretically, you should ask yourselves, like, can I theoretically build my own version of this? And if the answer to that is yes, then you have taken away the magic for yourself, right? And now a story that will sound very familiar 
to all of you. It is the big old project story, right? This is a project that had been running for a long time. I mean, it was running for more than eight years when I got there. And Chad, in this case, was um, a superhero, okay? He was like the developer in the team that everybody looked at for the stuff that they were doing, right? He was the one who read blog posts, who went to conferences. He was the one who always came up as like, okay, we, we have a better way of doing this. Let's do it like that from now on. And he really liked doing things the right way. So if he came up with a better way, that's he really wanted to introduce that to the team. And Chad was really careful. He always explained things to the team. He did workshops, made sure everybody was on board, made sure there was a technical fit. I mean, he did some awesome work. So what happened when Chad learned a better way or a new framework or whatever, he got everything up to speed. And then from then on, that was the way that they would do things as a team. They all agreed, they all knew how, and they just did it. Sounds right, doesn't it? But what happened is they got a code base that started looking like the trunk of a tree. Because they never got any permission from the business to refactor all the old, old code. So if you would look at a certain feature in the code base, you could tell when it was built judging by the practices that were used in this piece of code. And the problem is that they ended up with four ways of writing front-end code, they had uh, three ways of doing back-end, they had a couple of different API frameworks, um, they had two different database engines and so on. And the problem with this is that training a new person to get up to speed on that code base becomes extremely hard. And that is not good. So what did chat forget is when new tech goes in, you should take out, take some time and put, uh, pull out the old. Trim your stack, keep your stack manageable. Ideally, you can just bring in a developer that has the right skills and you can get them up to speed in, in less than a few weeks. You don't wanna have like a three month training uh, training program to get a new guy up to speed because that really, really hurts your philosophy. So what you can do is ask yourself, um, what problem does this new technology solve for me? And do we really need that technology? And if so, is there some old similar things in our code base that we can replace? And how much is the effort to replace those old things, right? And that, those estimates should, should actually be added on top of the cost of the implementation. And to make that visible to your product owners is you could basically tell them like, okay, the cost of keeping these two is this. There's a maintenance cost, there's an onboarding cost. I mean, it's not free to keep that code not refactored, right? You should basically hollow out that tree trunk. All your technologies should be at least recent and the, the thickness of your stack should be managed at all times, right? And if you have a hollow node trunk, um, it limits, you, you should, you could basically think about things like limiting in new introductions of technology until the old refactors are done. Um, that's a good way of um, making sure that this doesn't get out of hand because you could also get up to a point where you're actually refactoring seven pieces of technology, but you still have old and new code. You don't want that, right? Good. Now I have a, a last story about microservices. Microservices is a very, very controversial um, topic in this, in this talk. And the project that we were gonna work on, it was completely greenfield. We could start from scratch and we could choose whatever we wanted to do. And what we were building was a simple line of business application. Um, there was little complexity in it. Um, and in our team, we had experience in doing ASP.NET MVC. We had one junior, three developers that had like less than three years of uh, experience. And, um, and then uh, one senior, right? That was Chad. And there was no real experience doing ops in the team. So what they designed um, together with Chad as an architecture for their new tool that they were gonna build 
is they would switch their front end from razor views to angular instead of using the asp.net um, authentication module and they were going to use identity server they were going to run everything on docker containers in a kubernetes cluster they were going to do full-on microservices they were going to switch from sql server to mongodb and all these things they were new to them and you can already guess what happened the team got stuck and they got really stuck on learning the new stack that they had chosen because this stack um, got them stuck on doing their deployments it got them stuck on doing debugging they got stuck on using mongodb properly and the project got a huge delay and while you can think while you look at this is this is like a massive team skills violation and really it is i'm going to come back to that in a second it is also massively over engineered for what this application was supposed to do now regarding the team skills if you want to learn new skills while doing an, a real project this is never a really good idea but make sure that you don't combine a learning goal with a delivery goal if you know that you have to deliver by a certain date you should not like try and learn something new at the same time that's a bad idea if you do decide to learn something new learn one thing at a time and budget extra time for the learning part of it and you should make sure that your business knows that this risk is there and you hear phrases like yeah this new th way of doing things will make sure that we can deliver more and we can have higher quality well make sure that when you say that to your business that you can actually mean it and if you do this well there's no way that you can with a straight face say that this will actually improve your quality and your ability to deliver because it will hurt you for a long time so what do I think that Chad forgot here is that you should have an architecture that follows the problems that you actually have and not the other way around. You should make sure that your architecture evolves and you should look at that architecture and make sure that it solves those problems that you're actually having. At the time. Keep it as simple as you can. You start with the simplest solution that there is, deliver some features, discover your needs from running that code in production and maybe extract some services later on and you can easily prepare your code to be uh, ready to be separated you can have logical services inside the same deployment unit that you can later extract and easily run as a separate service but you don't need to bring in all that complexity to begin with you can just write logical services, deliver it as a monolith, and go from there. So microservices, was that the right choice? Well, there's a couple of reasons that you actually want to do microservices. And four of the reasons that you really want to get into microservices is when stuff needs to scale independently. You, so that you can balance the cost of a certain um, service with its speed. Or when you want to support uh, multiple clients and these clients all have different versions or different implementations that's a good reason to do microservices as well or if your services require different technology stacks or different libraries because then it becomes a technical problem often you cannot have two versions of the same library in a project so but you can have them in two different services conflicting dependencies is also a good reason to do this right <clears throat> now apart from these four all of the reasons that you're gonna come up with are basically made up um, these are like the real reasons that you want to do microservices and you will only develop that need once you grow past a certain scale that scale can come from the size of your team it can come from the amount of traffic that your application has to handle it can come from a lot of places um, but these are like the four main reasons why you would actually want to do microservices. So what could Chad have done is he could have let his architecture follow the needs of his application. He could have started simple and maybe like replace this front end with Angular. Like one, do one new thing. And then don't do microservices but develop it as a monolith, deploy it to production, learn from it, do proper solid so that you can de decouple uh, stuff later on maybe build the code in vertical slices uh, so that they can be split off later on um, 
And then you just deliver your value. And you deliver your value, you learn from production, and you adapt to the stuff that you run. Into. So if I summarize these six stories that I just told you, these are the six things that you should always keep in mind when you're making choice and when you're making choices in your development team. Make sure that the thing you're choosing is a technical fit for your problem. Check that there are no war warning signs that this technology might become a risk for you. Make sure that you get the whole team up to speed on this technology. Take away the magic. Understand how it was built before you start using it. Trim your stack. Make sure that old technologies get refactored out so that you can get new people up to speed in a reasonable amount of time. And make sure that your architecture follows the problems that you have and not causes new problems for you. But I think that you're all asking, like, who was Chad really? Like, who, who is this guy that you're talking about? And Chad, in these stories, in some of these stories, Chad was me. Or, or Chad was the whole team. Or it was like somebody else on the team, or in some of these stories I just made them up entirely. But what you can look at what Chad did in all of these stories, he acted because he cared. He wanted to deliver better software, but he failed because he looked at the wrong things. So Chad is an acronym for the carelessly or helplessly acting developer. But wouldn't it be better if we as developers were more red? It's better to be RAT, a responsibly acting developer. And when I was thinking about this, this is the reason that I invented the RAT certification program. So if you promised your manager that you uh, would get another certificate this year, this is your chance because there is a whole certification program. You can follow RAT Cert on Twitter um, or you can take a quiz, you can take the certification quiz on the website. The website is https um, redcert.com. Um, and if you get certified and you get the questions right, you can come and find me. Uh, you can hit me up and I'll give you one of these awesome certification kits with a certificate, some stickers, a coin that you can flip, some coasters. Um, because what I want to do is all of you to help me spread this message Make sure that teams make better decisions. Make sure that we deliver software in a better way in the future. My name is Hannes. I work as a principal.net consultant and a confidence coach for a company called Access. I have three kids. One of my hobbies is building guitars. I'm also a Lego enthusiast. If you want to get in touch with me, with me that is my Twitter handle and my ICQ number, make ICQ great again. Um, because this is a digital feed, you can ask your questions um, through the app. Um, thank you for joining me. 